This concept of encoding specificity in psychology is sometimes called context-related learning. Here's the idea. You perform as you practice. The exam conditions require a desk, a hard chair, good light, silence. So, how should you study? Same way. The theory is that when you're studying, part of the context around you gets automatically <coughs> encoded into memory. So if you put yourself back in that context, it's going to be a trigger to memory. You may think that sounds pretty far-fetched, and I'm not going to claim that that's going to magically turn into a, you into a great student. But it's actually been shown in studies that if you switch the environment, make it totally different, it's less good than reinstating the environment. Um, if you're actually in the same classroom as you took your classes, get the same seat. Because the angle at which you are might just cause associations to occur that you can get um, the material back. If you have to go to the pub or the gym or somewhere like that, you can't do that. Although you could imagine being there when you're studying. Encoding specificity. Encoding is specific to the context in which it is learned. How do you prepare for your exam? First of all, the basics. You should know the exam content and conditions. This is so much common sense. I'm sure you all know this. I'm sure you, this is not something new. Um, but what does it mean? It means you should know the content. That is, what is the exam going to cover? Is it part of the course, the last third? Is it half the course? Is it a cumulative exam in which you have to do everything from the beginning of September? This, of course, will be in your course handout. Can you consult previous exams? Can you go to the library and get copies of old exams? That's a really good idea because it shows you the structure. It shows you how they're set up. You can look at them. It gives you an idea of content. If you do that, by the way, um, just make sure that it's the same. <laughs> In other words, that the professor has said, well, I don't do that type of exam anymore, and you're sort of wasting your time. But assuming it's basically the same principle, that can be very helpful. And you might get lucky. There's the odd lazy professor who actually recycles exams. <laughs> I know somebody who had that experience, a student who uh, looked at an exam and went over it and practiced it, went into the exam and couldn't believe her eyes when she opened the exam. It's the one she had worked on for a week at home practicing and looking up all the answers. <laughs> That's what you call acing an exam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Massed versus distributed practice. Should you study continuously, without breaks, concentrated, or should you break it up into periods with breaks? Well, uh, the research is pretty clear on this. For most people, yeah, I think you know the answer, uh, distributed is better than massed. How long should these magic periods of study be? Well, again, trial and error. but. Some people have suggested minimum of 20 minutes constant study with perhaps a two or three minute break, up to maybe 45 or 50 minutes with a five, 10 or 15 minute break. You have to find out what's best for you. But the idea is plan it, stick to it, knowing there's a break coming. You see, if you study continuously with mass practice, you're probably gonna get overtired, your concentration's gonna drop, your attention's gonna wander. So you've gotta break it up so that you keep sharp. You see, if you're totally engrossed in what you're doing, if you're interested in what you're doing, you can have mass practice. You're perfectly capable of getting in the flow, which is a technical term. People who work on their own original creations, artists, craftspeople, writers, they can go for hours on end without breaks. Sometimes they don't eat, sometimes they don't sleep, it's effortless. So what I'm saying to you is, I don't recommend mass practice in most cases, but if you get hooked on a course, if you get hooked on a topic, you just might find yourself able to do this. And what's wonderful is that it feels good and you learn. Now, you've got to study for more than one exam. Same principle. Should you put all the stuff together for one course or should you chop around from course to course? What I suggest is that um, perhaps for courses that really interest you and that you like, you can for a given day, do nothing but that course, because there's no problem keeping your attention. But if you've got four courses, four other courses, three other courses, and you don't like them as much, 
then maybe that's where you do one session at one course, then you go to the other course for a second session, you go to the third session, and so on. You've probably heard the old adage, practice makes perfect. I know this because I had a teacher at my high school who had a kind of mantra. One of the good things about these kinds of teachers, if you're totally bored, you can have fun by counting the number of times <laughs> they say their pet saying. You can sort of jot it down and keep track and make charts and even do stats on it. I sound as if I know what I'm talking about here. Um, anyway, Mr. McEachney, whose nickname was Kiki behind his back, in his inimitable nasal twang, would say, practice, practice. Practice. <laughs> and if you didn't perform, you know what you would say? You didn't practice, boy. <laughs> Here's something you may not know about. It's something called the lag effect, which is that each space gets progressively longer. So if you're going to repeat something, you should repeat it with spaces, but you should lengthen the spaces. Why is this a good idea? Well. It's been demonstrated that spaces allow consolidation to occur in memory, but if you need a longer space, when you go back to the information again, you might think it in a slightly different way, and if you've gone a bit longer, you're going to add more ways, which means more cues for retrieval and better recall. There's a system that's been suggested, there are quite a few of these systems. This one's called the SQ3R system. Survey. First of all, you do an overview of the material to find out the main points and see the big picture. You don't try to remember it. You form questions, as I've just said. Then you read with these questions in mind. You're probably taking notes as well, by the way. But you're at the study stage now where you are reading with a question in your mind. You've probably had the questions before, so you're getting ready for your exam. Now, that's what many students do, and they do it very well. But there's another two steps here, and most people don't do it because it takes time and effort. Recite it. In other words, there's a section. You have a question, you read it. You say, okay, I know that. That's the answer to the question. You close your eyes, you close the book, and you say, can I repeat that? Or even better, take out a piece of paper and write it down. It takes time, but writing it down tests yourself for memory. It's called the testing effect. And then review, you go back to all the bits, and you close your book, you close your notes, and you sit back and you think about it. Um, I was preparing today's cl class, today's lecture. I've got my notes and I'm using them as you can see. But yesterday when I was out for an exercise, it took about an hour and I just tried to reconstruct this whole class in my head to see if I could do it without notes. Uh, it turned out I couldn't. <laughs> uh, well, I could have muddled through, but I realized that I'm going to have my notes and I have the luxury of that. But I can know exactly where I am when you do something like that. Principle tip seven, recall, recite, and record it. I think it's a good idea. The key to memorizing is to understand and relate. Now this is the place where you might actually consider your study partner be a teacher. The best way to know if you understand something is to try to teach somebody else. Have you ever found that? Uh, professors are wonderful students because they're spending their whole time explaining it to other people and they realize when they try to privately before the class, they don't get it. They say, oh gosh, I can't do that because I don't understand it myself. It's only when you go out and explain it that you understand it. So you can have a study partner. If the person's not taking the same course as you, you have to try to explain to a blind <coughs> mind. That's a pretty good test. But if the person is in your course, they can actually help you and you can take turns. Now, what about sitting the exam itself? You should ideally be in a state of anticipatory excitement, right? It's a challenge. I want to show that professor what I know. This is what athletes are like. They can't wait to get to the game. And the magician can't wait to get to the piano. The student can't wait to get to the exam because they're so ready. That's an ideal world, I know. <laughs> but that's what you strive for. Two kinds of questions. Now, are the people here who are going to be writing multiple choice exams at all? Some. Uh, SC short answer? All right, okay, so I'll do both. Objective questions. Warning, watch out for the tricky alternatives. Uh, four options is not too bad, seven is hellish. 
especially when it says both A and B, neither A or B, A or B or C, etc. Well, just be really careful if you get that. You're going to have to be really on the ball and watch out. But here's something you may not have thought of. It's a two-pronged strategy for writing multiple choice answers. You start out by converting the multiple choice question into an open-ended answer. What do you do? In the STEM, you read it carefully, you underline, highlight, or whatever, to make sure you understand the key points. But you cover up the four alternatives. You read the STEM, and you try to answer it from your own memory. You might jot that down, and then you look at the alternatives. If one of them matches what you just came up with, the chances are that's correct. Not guarantee, but the chances are. Now, that may not work. Or even if it does, you should go to the second stage. Again, you read the question, highlight the important terms, and eliminate alternatives. In other words, if you see one that looks pretty ridiculous, uh, knock it off. Of course, there are circumstances under which you are totally stuck. So what do you do? Well, these are tips. Uh, don't tell anybody I told you to do this, and then blame me if it doesn't work. But uh, according to certain books I've read in multiple choice test taking, longer answers are often right. So if all else fails and you don't have absolutely no idea, you might pick the longer one. If there are two that are opposites, the chances are one of them is right. The examiner is trying to be clever. You know, make it this or the opposite of that. Actually, if one of them is right, that's what you should do. And then, of course, if all else fails, you close your eyes and you go like that. <laughs> and, uh, just make sure there's no penalty for wrong answers. Otherwise, you might end up with a minus score in the test. Number one, look at the marks distribution. And if some are worth five points and some are worth 20 points, it's wise to spend more time and effort on the 20 point one. Um, so what you have to do is examine how the marks are allocated and plan your time on the exam. Probably recommended to do first what you know best. It's a confidence booster, but be careful. Uh, you can get carried away, and then they say pencils down, and you say, what do you mean pencils down? I'm just uh, getting into my wonderful answer and what I know best. And you didn't do the other four. That's not good. As I said before, read the question carefully, highlight the important <coughs> terms. I give you a glossary of words in my handout that might be helpful here. If it says discuss, that means present an argument, present some facts. Define means probably a one sentence definition. Elaborate, compare and contrast. You've got to know all these buzzwords, know the key words, know what they mean. And if it asks, for example, criticize, don't spend time defending. If it says defend the position, don't spend time criticizing because you're not being asked to do it. Give the professor what he or she wants. Answer the question that's asked. There's nothing more frustrating to write things down, think you've done well, and later on get the exam back and it says irrelevant. Ah. <laughs> I thought it was good stuff, and it probably is good stuff for another day. My thesis today, as you know, is that academic learning is a skill. You can develop a skill, it can be coached, it can be improved, and I think it can even be perfected. Um, but it requires effort and it requires time. Now, that's the doorway of my high school where Kiki worked. Um, and um, you can't see it, unfortunately, because it's buried up there. But the school motto is there, and it's in Latin, by the way. Believe it or not, the whole school motto was floriat labori, let it flourish by work. That's all we were supposed to do at our school, just work, 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 practice, practice, practice. <laughs> we started out with two quotations. I'm going to finish with a quotation. Ever heard of Yogi Berra, famous baseball coach? Um, he had a baseball quotation, and I have kind of modified it slightly for you. Keeping in mind the two quotations, here's Yogi Berra. Academic learning is 90% practice, and the other half is talent. <laughs> Thank you.